Belarus has supported Russia since the start of the war in Ukraine. It's provided weapons, military bases and logistical support. But is that support set to escalate into something more active? In Belarus society, there is a consensus that we don't support this war, that the Belarus army should not participate. Lukashenko also feels it, also understands that if he sends out Belarus troops to Ukraine, they can defect, they can turn arms against him. That's from my guest today. Franak Vyachorka is chief political advisor to Belarusian opposition leader Tsvetlana Tsikhanovskaya. She claims to be the national leader of Belarus. But how legitimate is her claim? And how successful has her opposition been to Alexander Lukashenko's regime? Franak Vyachorka, welcome to Conflict Zone. Hello. Mr. Vyachorka, uh, over the weekend you had Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu in Belarus meeting his opposite number. And just a few days before that, you had unnamed Russian generals arriving in Minsk as well for various meetings. Is Russia planning an escalation of the war in Ukraine with Belarus's help? Uh, the visits of Russian generals and officers are usual thing since uh, Lukashenko came to power. But when war has started, um, all the deals that were signed became secret. And we don't really know how much independence, how much sovereignty remained in the hands of uh, Lukashenko, in the hands of Belarusian people. We believe that every visit uh, they decide on giving a uh, Belarus unit or Belarus uh, sector of, of uh, military complex under control of Russia. Shoigu and uh, Shoigu's recent visit is also important uh, because it happened just after the death of Minister Mackey, uh, the foreign minister which was very close to Lukashenko. And it was perceived by Belarusian officials as the reminder who is in charge. So Belarusian officials, Belarusian officers are afraid of Moscow. I do want to talk about the death of Foreign Minister Mackay, but first I'd like to talk about what these visits by Russian generals mean. You have, for instance, described as a very dangerous development reports of Russian missiles, including hypersonic missiles and fighter jets such as MiG-31s being stationed in Belarus. What is the information you have? Is Russia planning large-scale air assaults on Ukrainian infrastructure from Belarus? Uh, the last missile strike that we have witnessed was on November 6th from Belarus territory. So it means already for two months there were no strikes from, from Belarus. But at the same time, uh, more than 10,000 Russian soldiers arrived to Belarus and they're uh, deployed in different parts of our country. They're passing military training. Along with the um, uh, troops, uh, we see uh, vehicles, we see uh, some tanks, we see some divisions of air defense systems arriving to Belarus. It doesn't seem they are bringing attacking uh, group of, of army on Belarus territory. It, uh, it seems they are bringing uh, the army in order to control the situation in Belarus, in order to fix the Russian occupation of Belarus. Uh, we really believe that uh, Russia can use Belarus as a consolation prize in case if it will lose the war in Ukraine. Are you worried that Belarusian troops might be thrown into the fight in Ukraine? Uh, it's uh, still uh, very likely, uh, but not next two, three months. Uh, right now, Russia doesn't have enough uh, capacity, uh, nor uh, weapons, uh, nor vehicles on Belarus territory. Um, Belarus army itself will not be able to conduct such operation. It needs strong backup, uh, primarily technical backup from Russia. Also, Belarusian soldiers, they don't have morale. They don't see Ukrainians as enemy. In Belarus society, there is a consensus that we don't support this war, that the Belarus army should not participate. Lukashenko also feels it, also understands that if he sends out Belarus troops to Ukraine, they can defect, they can turn arms against him, there will be split of elites, there will be new wave of protest. And he is really afraid of sending Belarus and troops to, to Ukraine because it will it can cost him the power. So you're confident that with Russia's back to the wall in Ukraine, essentially uh, uh, losing the fight, uh, falling behind on the battlefield, as Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, says, that President Putin is not pressurizing, pressuring 
Alexander Lukashenko to commit his troops into battle. You're confident of that? Uh, I think they are playing the role. It's the performance. Uh, Lukashenko is playing the independent leader who supports Russia and he wants to stay exclusive alive for Putin because this is the only way to stay in power, to have guarantees that Putin will not come to murder him. But also for um, Lukashenko, Putin is, is very, very important right now in order to control the internal domestic uh, situation. Uh, to say that uh, um, Putin is not pressurizing Lukashenko, I think let's let's imagine that this is the leash and Lukashenko is the dog on the leash. And Putin is trying to shorten this leash so much as possible to not allow Lukashenko to not leave him uh, a space at all. This is the goal of Putin, to create the puppet regime, satellite regime, which will be doing 100% of everything the capital, Moscow, will want from him. So you had said in November uh, that Putin was not interested in sending Belarusian troops to Ukraine. You stand by that? Yes, yes. I think it will create more problems than benefits. Uh, it's not experienced army. I was in the army. I was serving in military on the border with Ukraine. It was 10 years ago, but I know what, what, uh, what is it. Lukashenko invested uh, in KGB, in uh, secret services that, that aim to protect himself, but he never invested in Belarusian army. When Belarusians will receive this mobilization calls, there will be huge protest, huge resistance, because society doesn't support this war uh, at all. And the Lukashenko probably told Putin about this. Also, Lukashenko used the legend that uh, Putin, if I will send my troops, then the Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia will attack me. Because you see, they are preparing, the, uh, they escalate, they deploy more troops on the border. So he used this as the reasoning in order to not send out Belarusian troops. So they play this performance, everyone is happy, they create the pressure. They create the pressure on Ukraine, constant pressure that this might happen. And I think that the, even the, the threat of sending out Belarusian troops, it distracts a, a, a big forces of Ukrainian army. Help us understand uh, Alexander uh, Lukashenko, the current leader of Belarus. Would he rather be on the side of President Putin or would he rather be with the West, for instance? He will be with Putin because Putin is mentally close to him. Uh, Lukashenko is the Soviet man. Uh, he is very anti-Western. Democracy is something that goes against his uh, principles, against his uh, nature. Uh, he chose uh, Russia and Putin instead of Belarusian people in 2020. He could agree on dialogue with Belarusian protesters two years ago. But instead, he called for Putin's help to suppress uh, this uh, protest. And right now, we see, we see the tipping point of this pro-Russianism in head of Lukashenko. Now, in October, Alexander Lukashenko told BB NBC, I'm sorry, in an interview, that no one was closer to President Putin than him. Do you read that as a signal to the West that he was ready to mediate with President Putin, between President Putin and the West, to curtail his dependence on Russia? Lukashenko just wants to stay relevant, to be important. He is, you know, this like alpha, alpha man. He wants to be the first everywhere. This is why he was so happy when the first Minsk uh, negotiations took place in 2014 and Lukashenko hosted them. Lukashenko wants to be uh, the big player. He wants to be in the first league. And all, his, all these statements about his uh, closure, closeness to, to Putin, about uh, uh, nuclear weapons uh, in Belarus, in order to raise the price, to raise the worth of himself. But usually it's just a bluffing. He, he is very poor, old, uh, weak, insecure man. Uh, you talked about the death of Vladimir Makai, Belarus's foreign minister, a close confidant of uh, Alexander Lukashenko. Did Russia have anything to do with Makai's death? Uh, possible. Everything is possible right now. Uh, we can't exclude any of the versions. Um, we still didn't see the publication of the, uh, the document about the death of Makai with diagnosis. Uh, it's very strange. It's one week past. But still, there is no official information. Also, the 
um, the statement from Lukashenko about the death of Mackay appeared many years after the fact was revealed. It means there is something uh, behind it. Uh, we see that Belarusian officials are very threatened. They, they feel um, that they can be the next. And I think this death um, is, could, be, could be just just death. But also it can be part of the bigger events, bigger dynamic we, we still can't see. You talked of uh, Russian troops in Belarus there to, quote, control the situation. Is Belarus a hostage of Russia? Belarus is taken hostage of Russia and of Putin together. These two criminals, they just use Belarus territory uh, in order to, to attack Ukraine, to revive empire. And not to just Belarus, but Belarusian people are taken hostage. Let's not forget that there are thousands of people in jail. Hundreds of thousands uh, were forced to flee the country. In 2021, when crackdown took place against Belarus and democratic forces, it was a preparation for Russian war against Ukraine. You talked about the uh, pro-democracy movement. Let's talk about that. Uh, last week, opposition leader Maria Kolesnikova ended up in intensive care after she was transferred to hospital from her prison cell. She was perhaps one of the last major opposition figures left inside Belarus. Would you say her fate is a big blow to the opposition movement inside Belarus? Uh, Maria is a big inspiration for many Belarusians, especially Belarusian women. She became a symbol of resistance. Uh, she was leading these uh, massive, huge rallies in uh, August and September of 2020. Uh, and right now, when we found out she's in an intensive care unit, it was a big shock to all of us. But was it a big blow? Of course it was a big shock. Was it a big blow to the opposition movement? Uh, yes, it was, it, was, it was a blow. It was a blow, uh, but also we have to investigate what happens to her because just before um, ended up ending up in the hospital, she was put in the punishment cell. This is the KGB style torture cells. People are without fresh air. People are without communication. They could be beaten there. And uh, something, something um, happened wrong to her. Perhaps there was an order from Lukashenko personally to punish her. Doesn't all this show that the opposition movement inside Belarus has been silenced? Uh, no, it's not silenced. It, uh, it changed the form of resistance. Uh, there are many partisan groups. They work in every region of the country. Most of them uh, participated in stopping Russian trains. They conducted sabotage on the railways in March and April this year. There are uh, thousands of people, members of the cyber partisan groups, the paralyzed state infrastructure, and a few weeks ago they uh, hacked the Russian Oversight Committee, Roskomnadzor, leaked the data to journalists. And uh, there are many activists who put Belarusian or Ukrainian flags all over the country. Uh, we see also mass disobedience campaign not all over the country, but in big cities primarily, when the workers of the big factories refuse to do their job, for example. Let's take that, uh, so let's take that at face is, value, but doesn't, hasn't that invited a, a greater crackdown against them from Alexander Lukashenko? It is, indeed, indeed. And we see right now the repressions bigger than in 2020. Uh, every day from 10 to 20 people are being detained. Uh, and people not just detained, they're tortured, they're harshly beaten, more activists die in prison. And uh, this uh, shock a lot, and we call on the international community to react. We call on the UN uh, to take uh, urgent measures. Let's talk about uh, numbers. The Belarusian human rights group Vyashna claims as many as 5,000 people are in prison due to political reasons. They are not classified officially as political prisoners, but they are in prison because of their political activism. The United Nations says hundreds of thousands of Belarusians are leaving the country and going to neighboring countries. My question to you, therefore, is who is left in the country to carry out an opposition against Alexander Lukashenko? Uh, Belarus is 9 million uh, people uh, country, uh, so the protest uh, took more than 1,000,000.5 um, uh, participants. So even if, uh, let's say, a few hundred thousand Belarusians left the country, still we have a million to resist. Uh, also, there is a big um, disappointment, a big um, uh, 
willingness to change the situation and to prevent Belarus from participating in this war. So I think people who participate in the resistance right now, they did not participate in 2020. They are new people who reacted on the fact of, of the war and they resist right now. They are on the front lines and they go out and they protest despite all the terror. You are based outside of Belarus as an opposition. How effective are you? How many people, for instance, has your movement been able to release from prison? Uh, we are in daily touch with Belarusian groups uh, on the ground, with local communities, with media, with bloggers, civil journalists uh, who spread, you know, this printed uh, some is that leaflets uh, put in the ma in mailboxes. Uh, Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, leader of Belarus, uh, uh, who, who, who won elections, she created the United Transitional Cabinet, which is like a government in exile, and which gives we know we know all that we know all that, Mr. Vyachorka. But then, how is that helping activists inside Belarus? You admitted earlier that they keep getting thrown into prison, and that crackdown has only increased since 2020. So, how is your work outside? helping them inside in Belarus? So we pass assistance, we try to pass equipment where possible, we conduct information campaigns to counter Russian and Lukashenko's uh, propaganda primarily, but also to inspire Belarusians to fight. We try to keep the morale high, uh, to build connection between different groups, different partisan groups uh, within the country. And uh, we can uh, lobby for more international support for Belarusians who are still fighting in the country. Is it not a failure of your opposition movement that after 2020, at that time when there were massive street protests and it seemed that the game was up for Alexander Lukashenko, he has been able to hold on and continues to govern Belarus. Is that not a failure of your opposition movement? Uh, not yet, as we see. Uh, the crackdown in 2020 was preparation for the war. Lukashenko wouldn't survive without Putin. It's Putin who provided him with money, with uh, soldiers, with the resources back in 2020. And uh, right now, Lukashenko is paying his debt uh, back to uh, Putin. It's not a failure yet, but the situation became much more complex. Now we are part of the bigger regional geopolitical crisis. Now we are fighting not just for democracy, for democratic elections, but we are fighting for very existence of Belarus statehood. And in order to get Belarus free and independent, we need the victory of Ukraine. Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, your boss, to, to whom you ad, uh, provide political advice, emerged from the 2020 elections, and particularly the protests, the mass street protests that happened after that. Now, she presents herself as the leader of the Belarusian opposition. Is she? Uh, I think she's a national leader of Belarus and president-elect who won elections but didn't take her office because of Lukashenko and Putin. Is she the leader of the Belarusian opposition? I think she's the leader of Belarus nation because Lukashenko is in opposition. She got more than 70% of votes. I should call her the president. So she does not lead a united Belarusian opposition? She's leading the United Democratic Forces, uh, exactly. She united all the major groups, uh, traditional political parties and the new groups that appeared in 2020. And uh, of course, there are different ideologies, different uh, views uh, among different politicians. But she's absolutely uh, a unifying figure to, to all of those who see Belarus free and democratic. Let's see how unifying that is, because an opinion poll by Telegram-based pollster Narodny Opros among opposition-minded Belarusians found that the Kalinowski Regiment of Belarusian volunteers fighting in Ukraine was five times more popular among Belarusians than Mrs. Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya. Clearly, she's not a leader of a united opposition, is she? Uh, this is the pollster just among activists of this specific group. And Kalinovsky Regiment is just the group of military volunteers fighting in Ukraine. So let's not compare, you know, political leadership and uh, and uh, fighters. And uh, let's not forget that Svetlana Tsikhanovska participated in elections. She won elections. Multiple um, observers, surveys, polls, uh, internet voting proved that she won elections. She received 
two or three million votes. So the Kalinowski regiment is irrelevant as an opposition group? Kalinowski regiment is the part of the democratic and independence movement. They are fighters uh, in Ukraine. They are fighting for liberation of Ukraine and they are uh, they deserve a huge respect and we fully support everything they do. Would you say they are popular? Uh, they are not popular as politicians. They are popular as soldiers because they sacrifice their life in order to, to save Ukraine. They understand that when Ukraine wins, Belarus wins as well. So they are not seen as a part of the opposition then? Uh, now they are fighters, you know, let's, uh, let's divide, you know, politicians and, uh, and the fighters and military volunteers who serve in Ukrainian army. Of course, they are, they are playing a very important role. And first of all, they save, they preserve the good name of Belarusians who were seen by many Ukrainians as, uh, as aggressors. And Kalinovsky regiment, they proved that not all Belarusians are like Lukashenko, that Belarus regime and people are two different things. Right. Let's talk about Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya. You keep saying in this interview that she's the national leader of Belarus and she herself keeps calling herself the national leader of Belarus. But who, except for Lithuania, agrees to call her that? Almost in every country she comes, uh, she's met on the presidential level. In the parliament, she's always addressed as uh, Madam President. Uh, today, just in one but hour, there is no, meets, there uh, is no, But there is no official recognition of her as the leader of Belarus? Uh, there is de facto recognition. There is the level of uh, protocol which uh, defines her as the head of state. Uh, there is no uh, legal recognition because it will take years and we don't have these years. We, don't, we didn't go into this uh, game of legal recognition. We but it's more than just a game, that. isn't it? Because Alexander Lukashenko's regime continues to have diplomatic relations with a lot of countries, particularly those in Asia and Africa, for instance. There, Alexander Lukashenko counts as leader of Belarus and not Mrs. Tsikhanouskaya. That's true. That's true. And this is the, um, this is the problem for us because these nations then... They come to the United Nations General Assembly and they vote uh, very often in support of proposals of Lukashenko or Russia. Yes, that's true. This is why we are trying to reach out the countries outside of the European Union. We already reached out Latin America and we have some, some relations there. Uh, we reached out to Africa, Southeast Asia as well, but a lot of uh, work uh, to, to be done. But the most important in terms of economy, in terms of trade, and political relationship, of course, is the European Union, where Lukashenko is not recognized as, uh, as the leader. And now we are asking, we are calling on recognizing him as the, as the war criminal. Now, Mr. Tsikhanovska has also sought to find a common cause with Ukrainians. We began this interview talking about the Ukraine war. Let's talk about the Ukraine war. She has said, and I quote, there cannot be a free Belarus without a free Ukraine. Does Ukraine see it in the same way as well? Uh, yes, I think Ukraine sees, but a little bit, little bit different. They see Belarus as the guarantee of security, of safety, because when Lukashenko stays in power, there will be constant threat to Ukraine, like it happened in February, February this year. Lukashenko promised that there will not be attack from Belarus territory, and suddenly this attack happened, and uh, um, Russian tanks almost reached Kiev from from Belarus. Uh, Ukraine understands the importance of uh, having good relationship with Belarusian people. We have 1,000 kilometers uh, common border. And uh, right now we are trying to uh, build this uh, relationship again. Uh, we are trying to coordinate our activities uh, and to, to work, uh, to coordinate our activities on resisting uh, Russian occupying forces. Situations in Belarus and Ukraine are different, but we fight the same enemy. One final question. She, uh, Mrs. Tsikhanovskaya hasn't yet been able to meet President Zelensky. When is that going to happen? Yes, she didn't meet uh, officially, only uh, informally at one of the public events. Uh, it will happen when there will be willingness of Ukrainian side. But uh, she has very good relationship with Verkhovna Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, we have good relationship with Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but we understand why Ukrainians don't meet her. They don't want to provoke Lukashenko. Is it also because they do not trust her? No, I think because uh, there was a clear sign of Lukashenko if 
Kyiv will meet Tikhanovskaya. Uh, Lukashenko can escalate the, uh, the conflict against Ukraine or even introduce troops. So for Ukrainians right now, the most important to minimize the risks. When will Ukraine recognize her as national leader of Belarus officially? I think it, uh, if, if Lukashenko introduces uh, troops, Belarus troops, to, to Ukraine, these processes will be uh, speeded up. And then Ukraine can recognize uh, Tsikhanovsky and meet her. But right now they are very cautious. They don't want to, um, to play with fire. It's been a pleasure talking to you. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Franak Viachorka.